My name is Andrew Bowman. I'm a fifth generation farmer just outside of Oneida. I was very active in FFA and I continued that uh, with some research. I went to the University of Illinois. I got my degree and uh, now I'm running the farm. I've got some popcorn. Our, our family farm has diversified and that was kind of the interest point for trying research such as this that we'll talk about. And uh, anyone who participates or if you guys want to wrestle at the end, I've got a couple bags I'd be happy to give away. Always think it's a good giveaway to engender goodwill from the audience uh, when, when we do this. Charles, I'll let you introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, I wanted to say um, just a quick Sarah, disclaimer. My name is Charles Martin. And uh, just a quick disclaimer, whatever uh, products or equipment that we talk about, we are not here to uh, endorse anything. This is not this is not a sales program or anything like that. Uh, also, um, you might want to hold off on the questions uh, until the end because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and then I want to preface it, this. The uh, title uh, was originally uh, Cura Clover into a uh, perennial living mulch, corn into a perennial living mulch. And the it, convention of other scientists is moving more towards the uh, nomenclature of uh, perennial ground covers. So that's what we will be talking about. That's what we'll be referring to. And uh, this is for your benefit also. When you go online, you might want to type in perennial ground covers instead of perennial living mulches. So, It should also be noted, Charles is not self-promoting, but he was a researcher for many years at New Mexico State University before he came back home to uh, this. So he, he adds a lot of uh, you know academic rigor to, to our yeah. conversation when we do this. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Yeah. So this is the agenda we're going to go through. And I always like to have a presentation that just says these are the things you know, I hope you guys can get out of this. And, and, you know, Charles said, hold off questions unless you got a really burning one or if you're bored, dozing off. But we'll talk about why you would want to consider a perennial ground cover. What was the, you know, interest for us to try this? You know, prior research models and guiding principles. We won't spend a lot of time on that, but that kind of says, okay, where, where does this kind of make sense? And what are the principles that would make this a meaningful decision for an operation? our test and then we get down to brass tacks, you know, the bottom line for you all. What worked, what didn't, what are some things you can take home with it? So that's what we'll jump into. It should be acknowledged, Charles will talk a little yeah. bit, though this came from a grant that we obtained. I was real fortunate to get a, a grant back in 2019 uh, from uh, North Central SARE uh, on this project. And so I'm very grateful for their help on this. And part of that grant is that we share the results with everybody. So we appreciate you all being here and hope that this, you know, it's not the round table forum like that we've, that's also being done here at the conference, but we hope it's something that can stimulate greater thought going forward. Another I wanna, acknowledgement. I want to specify that this is exploratory. This is really, um, it's not just cutting edge, this is bleeding edge. And uh, it's not a replicated trial. If any of you are researchers, uh, we don't have real, solid, replicated uh, information to share. This is all just farmer experience. So I would like to acknowledge Gabe Brown. Is there anybody here who knows about Gabe Brown? Okay, good, good. Um, I was real privileged to attend uh, his one of his sessions, um, and he has been a real inspiration for me, along with uh, Dr. Kenneth Albrecht, who is now retired, uh, but this is his research that I have pretty much based my project on. Yeah, and following in that vein, you know, you ever hear the cliche to a guy holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Well, one thing I appreciate about Gabe Brown is that he's essentially organic, right? But he doesn't get certified because he believes that he wants to use every tool in the toolbox, but only when he needs it. So I appreciate that. And that's, you know, part colored part of, you know, the perspective when we were designing the things that we wanted to test here. So I'll let uh, Charles kind of talk about this. Like, why would you consider a perennial ground cover? Yeah, uh, for me, the the big importance was the non-disturbance over time. And uh, as I will mention later on, um, this will also help to relieve the uh, taking out of the land from uh, 
production to grow a cover crop. One of the biggest challenges to growers uh, in incorporating cover crops is the fact that they either have to take the ground out of production and either before or after the growing season. And this way you're able to grow a cover crop simultaneously with the cash crop. And uh, we're going to have to start to find more ways to introduce and reincorporate cover crops with uh, our, our cropping system, our cash cropping system, uh, because the depletion of the soil over time is just too important to uh, neglect. So. so these are some of the research models. These are pictures taken from, and Charles can talk, but I wanted to point out, I forget which picture this one is from, but- This is Iowa. That's Iowa. Okay, yeah. so that would be, I believe it was Dr. Cindy Bartles who did research on that. And I believe that was an article that was in strip-till farmer, <clears throat> no-till farmer years ago. And that was where I was first introduced to this idea. So that kind of got, you know, the, the groundwork running. That's a clover, but they, they actually did some of their research in sod. And, you know, you take university research with a grain of salt. Fred Bilo that was referenced this morning is kind of a, you know, an oddity because he's a lot more focused on, you know, commercial viability. A lot of research trials are small, they're replicated, but that kind of gave proof of concept and said, you know, th this is exciting and something worth trying. So yeah. could you comment on the other models? A little this bit? research is, I want to emphasize this research is not new. Uh, I first ran across Dr. Albrecht's uh, research going back to 2007, and uh, yeah. he's been working primarily with cura clover. Other people have been working with white clover, other kinds of clovers. Uh, and so you I think will- the clovers that are primarily decumbent, they're not gonna get very tall, and uh, they can be aggressive outside of the row, hence being here using, utilizing strip till as a venue to right. make it work. Yeah. The image on the left is a on the left is a replicated trial from Dr. Albrecht's research, and uh, it's interesting to see in the background he has other treatments uh, plots back there. I don't know if those are uh, because of fertilizer or because of um, they're just a control where there's no no cura clover, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's, you'll see that it's, it's interesting to see the differences there. And well, we'll see that later yeah. on too. Well, but one thing you'll see is intuitively, we know this is better, assuming we don't have a bunch of in row competition. We'll talk a little bit about that, but intuitively you're shading the soil. If you get a dry condition, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but on our farm <coughs> we're seeing, and I'm not a climate change you know, proponent or opponent. I feel like things are cyclical, but I think we are in a new cycle for whatever reason of fewer rains, but more intense when we get them. You know, my tile lines this year, we installed $200,000 worth of tile on a farm we just bought this year. And we put 15 inch mains in them, which some of you probably think that's huge. Some of you probably think that's small, depending on where you farm. For us, that's pretty big. Um, they have hardly run all year. And normally, you know, in March when they were putting it in, it would have been a deluge just shooting out. So we've been dry, but then we've had a three inch rain and a two inch rain and an inch and a half. And we have very good soils and we've been able to, you know, I think we're going to have a near record corn crop because of those rains that are timely. But I, one thing I do know is when you have plants covering the surface, you're not losing that water. So intuitively we know this is good. How do we make it commercial? How do we get these corn plants to look like these corn plants? So, yeah. Andrew is right. Uh, I feel confident in this system because it's based on sound uh, soil conservation principles. Uh, again, I learned these principles from uh, Gabe Brown. Uh, it's based on uh, no-till or minimum disturbance of the soil. And that's what I like about strip tilling is that you can not have to disturb the entire surface of the soil. And uh, you, uh, you want to have armor on the cover or cover on the soil. And that's why we go with the perennial living mulch. You want to have diversity both in above ground and below ground. Uh, and living plant, plants, the perennial living mulch system uh, is what uh, I consider to be uh, kind of like the epitome of a continuous uh, plant, living plant, a year round. And um, but you have to take into consideration the farmer's concept. Yeah, the only thing our project doesn't address is uh, livestock, uh, the, the cows and 
Pigs left my family farm in the 1970s before I was born. Back when Earl Butts said, get bigger, get out. My grandfather took the message and diversified elsewhere. But um, I, I do think a PGC is going to be excellent for incorporating livestock going forward. How many of you guys are also livestock farmers? A few of you? Okay. So this would really fit for your system. Uh, cur clover is bloating, by the way. But if you incorporate it with uh, grass, maybe a bluegrass or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, which they are researching also as a perennial ground cover, then that was another one of the uh, goals that I had was to integrate this uh, livestock with it. I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, these other principles. Uh, you pretty much know about the value of species diversity from an ecological standpoint. And uh, also uh, mutualism, which is a relatively new concept uh, that people have learned since uh, no-till first got uh, really popular. But uh, the mycorrhizae and the other microorganisms in the soil will actually link up and connect with each other. And they will exchange nutrients, they'll exchange hormones and things like that. Uh, I do want to show that mycorrhizae is an, an essential part of this program. Uh, this is a picture I downloaded from the University of Florida. And uh, what I really want to emphasize is not just the drastic difference between the mycorrhizae inoculated, but also if you see the uh, mycorrhizae reached over into the control plot and you can see that it all along too. the strip. And so in each one of those treatments, you can see that the mycorrhizae extended out at least as much as five or six feet, uh, which really struck me when I first saw that. And I don't know that everybody noticed that, but it really, it really, I really noticed it. So. Okay. You know, preaching to the choir, I think it's worth resetting the table though for this. You know, why do we want to strip till? It's going to reduce erosion. You're going to have warmer soil in the spring, reduce compaction, saves time, conserving fuel. The big two that we've talked about down here for purposes of today's discussion on a perennial ground cover or living mulch is improving your soil health and the better adoption of cover crops. So we don't need to harp on that. Let's jump into our two projects because we had two different SARE grants. So mine, you know, I, I was trying to uh, get the farm organic and I had it for a few years and then the popcorn business grew and we're not organic now, but I was very interested in using a perennial ground cover to be essentially my weed control. And we'll talk about why it didn't work, but where I think it can based on our research here. And I did a wide row comparison thinking, you know, if I have a 60 inch row, because that's some of the research um, that would also allow for mowing, you know, as a different control mechanism if the weeds got out of hand, just like in a thin stand of alfalfa as time goes on, you'll have weeds come up in it. But I've also, you know, I mentioned that I grow popcorn. That's another reason I'm interested in maybe backing up to the concept of mutualism and these plants. I don't have uh, the budget to do all of the testing I'd like. My popcorn is red and blue. How many of you knew popcorn came in colors other than yellow? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time when I give a presentation, people are confused. Group of farmers, I shouldn't be surprised. So my popcorn is going to taste different just by virtue of being a different hybrid, just like a Jonathan Apple versus a Granny Smith and so on. I believe, well, I, I know, I can't prove it, but from anecdotal experience that it already tastes better. And I think that's because of the strip till, putting the nutrient density where it's at. I think the next step is adding the biodiversity that this project could do. So, Charles? Uh, I'm not going to, we're not going to talk too much more about my project because it's already posted online. You can go to the SARE uh, website and find the more complete in detail uh, project report. And so I would much rather, we're gonna be concentrating more on Andrews because also the strip tilling is more relevant to uh, this program. Sure. So this is Charles's farm. Uh, just gives you, a, you know, he's got a lot of elevation change around his house. That's why that's pasture, but it's this, here I can use the laser pointer like a real professional here. This is the area that's nice and flat where we actually did the tests. Yeah. Um, more mine, than, oh, go ahead. More than 80% of my fields are a highly erodible land. So I was really especially interested in uh, erosion control and infiltration, managing the infiltration 
so that we don't get the runoff. Uh, so you can see it goes down through the pasture. Uh, this is this uh, left here. corner is the pasture, and you can out. just see yeah. how eroded it is. Yep. And here's mine. This is just a screenshot of where it was at. It was in this general location. The big thing, you know. We have a uh, 137 PI. I mean, every state has a slightly different productivity index. In Illinois, I believe the highest is 141. So I would call our soils A minus, like they're pretty buffered and resilient. I don't necessarily win in the coffee shop, but we almost never have a problem. We've got pretty good soils. The other thing I'll tell you, and I'm gonna use this phrase, so about 10 years and 70 pounds ago, I was a CCA walking fields, you know, and then we had kids and I decided I, I'd want to be at home during the summertime. And I like to use the phrase agronomic hedging, right? So I bring that up because this system, as we talk about what worked and what didn't, I think you're going to find that I personally don't believe that this is something you would want to adopt on every single acre, just in terms of logistics and so on. But for us, you know, it's taken five generations, you know, 147 years now, uh, but we now have 960 contiguous acres in one big chunk. You know, that's, you know, half of what we farm. So I have the opportunity that I can give quite a bit of TLC to certain acres because everything's close. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, I don't want to be the type of person that comes up with a great idea or executes on something really well and then, you know, joins forces with uh, the, the regenerative mafia and says, everybody needs to farm this way. I, I don't think that's gonna be realistic. So I like to say agronomic hedging. How can we apply this? But I think that's an important caveat when you guys see what we're talking about. So here was the setup and, uh, you know, Charles had it in a perennial already established. Mine was to simultaneously seed the cover and the cash crop at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So. And I think you put those two together. The idea would be you get a perennial established and then you would do the simultaneous seeding, you know, periodically as you're planting, as you're going into it to reseed it. And, and the cover crop species matters. Charles did some research years before right. on Balanza clover, yeah. which uh, creates hard seed and, and, and reseeds itself. I think that that's, has some merit. doesn't leave a lot of carbon, but it is right. a very good smother crop. Uh, I will say one thing, uh, curra clover is slow to establish. Yeah. Uh, it really takes about three years and it was not the most appropriate uh, selection for a project like this because it's only one or two years. It took me two years before to build up the uh, organic matter through cover crops before I even attempted to plant the curra clover. And the curra clover is, was wet, uh, it doesn't like wet soils. It doesn't like to have its feet wet. So we didn't really have much luck with that. Yeah. So here's what our theory was and what we did. And again, I'm going to say it didn't work, but I'm pretty confident why it didn't and what we're doing going forward. So we established it. So here's the next part. We used a flail chopper to create that mulch effect to hold back weeds. Then we strip tilled immediately after flail chopping, and then we came back with the planter. So we'll jump into it. Now, these are videos. Um, I think I'm just gonna mute them because we can narrate um, because they're kind of kind of wonky on us. As I said, the yeah. first year uh, we, we established curra clover and most of it uh, drowned or this was in the spring of 2019. If you remember that year, and I can't remember, I don't know anybody who doesn't remember that year. It was very wet. And so of, it who, who all had a lot of fun in 2019? How many people had prevented plant acres? Yeah. We didn't, but there were times I thought we should have. It wasn't a lot of fun. So well, I went from um, curra clover, uh, pure stand, to a mixed stand of different other clovers. This is balanza, uh, white clover. Uh, I got, tried to incorporate some grasses. There's and some then, mustards in there you can see. Yeah, yeah. and some wild mustard. Uh, mm -hmm. But we got a a decent enough stand to be able to do the project. I'm gonna skip these two. These were um, some of the older, um, those were some of the older stands that he had. Yeah. That was a slide we pulled out. That previous video just showed the benefits of cover crops and what kind of good tilth you can get from uh, mm -hmm. growing them. So this was year one at Charles's and he had a poor stand, no-till drilled. 
so you find out what what's the other cliche that we talk about at year one it sleeps year two it creeps year three it leaps that's what we hear a lot of so i think those of you that raise your hands of our livestock producers probably have quite a bit more opportunity i mean it, it's more work and you guys already do more work with chores and livestock but if you have you know a paddock system where you can you know, give up a portion of a field and not the whole field to start establishing things. I think there's a lot of opportunity here for you. Yeah, it didn't fill in nearly fast enough. Mm -hmm. You can see the yellowing down there. Uh, I think that was because there was uh, old uh, inoculum. It's species specific inoculum. Yeah. Uh, it's slow to grow. One benefit of curra clover is it's rhizomatous. So even if you can get it established over time, it will gradually fill in. So here's year two, you can see you know, that, that's not what we would call in commercial ag a homogenous stand, but it is very pretty. And I think there certainly there's plenty of diversity in here, you know, legumes, forbs, grasses, the whole nine yards. Um, but he tilled in a finer seed bed for all that. So here's a video and I'm going to tell you right up front, this is what we did wrong. Anybody have any guesses what went wrong? The mulching effect? What's that? Didn't let it get tall enough. I was too impatient. You know, my wife's nickname for me is, uh, you know, I considered getting on our school board and she said, you don't have enough time for that. And she said, more than that, you're a ramrod. You're not patient enough to deal with other folks and everything else. I said, I guess that's fair. Now this looked beautiful and it did leave a nice mat. But I still had the mindset when we did this that make hay while the sun shines, right? So I said, I have time to do it. I'm going to go do it now. That way I can get the planner and everything set up. I should not have done this until that biomass was waist high. Yeah. I believe that was the single greatest failure of this experiment. But let's talk a little bit about why we chose a flail chopper. The reason I wanted a flail chop is because you're doing that vertical you know, cutting. I think that creates a better mulch effect than, you know, a horizontal cutting like a typical bat wing. I think the bat wing would work if you had the right tillage set up, excuse me, strip till bar. Uh, but I believe as it gets taller, you know, the bat wing becomes more of a problem because the flail is gonna chop it into smaller chunks. It'll break down faster, but then you're gonna be able to get your strip till bar through it. But you can see what we did. This is the result immediately afterwards. Yeah, and, and we'll narrate it instead, but, you know, Charles is taking the video, but I will say we do have a couple of clods, but this was the most beautiful strip tilling I had ever done. I mean, the aggregation, and again, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound like we're bragging about those, you know, crazy Illinois farmers that have great black soils, and we do, but they're easy to screw up, right? Or I shouldn't say that. They're not easy to screw up, but they're easy to take away this nice aggregation and all that wonderful biology. This is what gives me hope for this system. And I, and I hope gives you all hope to consider trying something like it because that is the most beautiful strip just in terms of tilth and how it felt, how it smelled, everything. Yeah. All because we had that perennial cover set up there at Charles's. Got a question? Yes, this yeah. is year two. This is after. Uh, no, no, not at his place, at my place, because we were doing the simultaneous seeding and the simultaneous seeding didn't work. And what I'm finding is I think the simultaneous seeding that we'll show you has a place, but it should be reseeding, helping it out, not, you know, your primary establishment. Yeah, that is a spring strip. You'll, we'll show you here. There it is. This isn't mine. We, we had a collaborator uh, that uh, had a gladiator. I liked how the gladiator worked. Um, I actually bought a land lover last year that I think um, has some things that are better than the gladiator, some things that are worse. Um, the only reason I picked it was no one was bidding on it on Del Peterson's auction and it was heavy and it was heavier than what I had. My personal strip till bar was a nitro systems at this point and I knew it would not build the same berm. I mean, mine was a poor man's strip till. It got me started in 2013 on the cheap. You know, I've only got 40 some thousand in my bar. That bar, you know, is a $90,000 bar. Um, and it does a beautiful job. It really did. But I think 
the type of bar you've got. Personally, if I had a heated shop, I could take an idea from three or four of those guys that were out here and make my own. I'd probably start with, you know, the Gladiator, the Orthman frame, and then there's ideas I would take from each one. You know, the Land Lover, I think, kind of hybridizes certain things. But, yeah. Does anybody have any experience going through really thick vegetation with a strip till bar? What's your mix? Oh, well, good. Yeah. Well, we flail chopped. But I can see it now. You can certainly see it. Talking about the, the till on this one. The that's going on with the mixture of covers that Charles has, you can just see this beautiful structure. But look, we shouldn't be able to see that, Danny. We did not have nearly enough granted, cover. This is a good soil type to begin with. I mean, I, and we do have some chunks here. I like that. And I'm going to recommend that, to Charles. That dandelion's good for the pollinators, good for diversity, it has a tap root. I think that I would be, be able very to helpful. It. But we have a nice berm that can settle after that one inch rain and then plant into it. Now the key will be, even with the good gladiator that's been set, the planter's gonna need to have, you know, floating residue managers yeah. to kinda level that's a good like point. right here. I think you Took need the floating residue out, to even it out if you do fine, go into something like this, because you no doubt have seen it to take that too. Off, and then you're still gonna have a little bit of unevenness here. So this here, I don't wait. So this was the setup, and, and I take a picture of that, and it doesn't do it justice, but, um, I want you guys to see how busy this got, right? So our partner at the time had an eight row plot planner and this thing was $120,000 plot planner because he was a precision dealer and it had every single bell and whistle, every single toy, furrow fours, conceal, whole nine yards. But then that wasn't enough. So we, you know, in our infinite wisdom wanted to add and we put, there's the corner and there's more pictures of it of the Valmar 6056. The grant allowed us to pay for this. And that 6056 is essentially a cover crop seeding box. You could use it for dry fertilizer. It only holds 60 bushel though. And that's what these tubes are. And these tubes go to the back and there's a diffuser. And that was how we were trying to intercede. We were broadcasting between the rows. <clears throat> now I think this would have a lot of merit, as I said, reseeding, but you can see how busy this gets. That caused a problem because the tractor we had was a John Deere, it was a class six, I forget what uh, num model number it was, but it did not have the hydraulic poop to do the job. So we had to make two passes. So it was, inter it was simultaneous, but I made a pass to plant and then I used the same AB line and came back and simultaneously seeded because it was just way too much stuff going on. You know, high tech's great when it works. That's what my old math teacher used to say and why I, we should learn not to use calculators. He could have just as easily been talking about a farmer doing too much stuff with a with That's the an important setup. point uh, Andrew made is that this is going to take a lot of power. I mean, by the time you get the cedar and the strip tiller and everything all together, uh, it needs a lot of ho horsepower. It needs a lot of hydraulic power. Yeah. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can, I think that a col I think that a coulter machine would work better if you were doing a one pass in the spring. I, I do think that. However, if you had a stronger stand that was very rise autonomous, you know, like the if like if the curl were in year five and it was a lot more robust, you could make the argument that the shank would be better because it would actually you know cut through. Yeah. You could also argue that that would cause more problems because now it's going to ball up. That's why I sort of think that the way to do this is to strip in the fall and then come back and refresh in it because then it tries growing over and then you, you, you beat it back. Yeah. But I think you would definitely use a coulter system in the spring with a refresher, no shank. I think uh, given, the, given the density of the, of the sod, the, the cover crop, I really think you need that shank to get down there and break up the soil. So this video just kind of shows just how complicated the stuff gets. And I was just talking through some of the, the things that we had, because I mean, you had our clean sweep, we had the next gen precision playing monitor and the tractor. I don't know how I can speed that up because at the end of the video, it shows what I'm looking at. And that's where you're going to see how complicated it was. And again, a lot of people, and I forget, I don't think it was Chris, it was one of the other speakers said, you know, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, right? So some of this we overcomplicated. How do we simplify it so you guys can take this home and, and use it? 
and that's the principle. But I don't know, has it turned around yet? Just yeah. so, but you can see. Here's the other thing. We didn't this is plan. two days after. So we tilled, then we came back two days later. Right after a rain. Yeah, yeah, and we did get a rain, which kind of mellowed things a little bit further. Uh, I'm gonna here. This is what I wanted to show you, because now uh, you'll see here. There's the backside of the Valmar, and we pushed the hydraulics to the back, and that made it difficult. We needed a cab camera here because I can't see at the back of the tractor now. There was a lot of busy stuff going on. Did you want to hear this? N no, I wanted everyone just to see okay. how, what we were trying to do. There's the tubes that come out. You know, this was me kind of explaining why we had a problem and that the problem was we didn't have enough hydraulics to run all the bells and whistles of what we had. Should be noted, uh, gentlemen, I, one of the classes I went to yesterday was, uh, I forget his name now, but he had one where he had made his own, he, very impressive. He was farming with 40 series tractors, strip tilling, made his own rigs. I think you could do that with this too. I don't think you need all these bells and whistles. It was just a lot easier to use an eight row plot planter that had all those bells and whistles. Um, I will say that the hydraulic downforce that was on this, I think was important. I think that that really evened it out because I mean, the soil is going to be more robust to compaction. We saw that in a presentation yesterday when you've got living roots, it, you know, you're not going to compact as much. That also means that it's, it's just going to be a little bit rougher. So I think you'd want hydraulic downforce. I don't think it's a necessity though. I think uh, you could get by, you're just going to have to accept you're going to plant a little slower. That's okay too. I mean, if it's the difference between spending 50 grand and not, maybe we should just drive slower. Mm -hmm. Well, my, no, yeah, oh, my yeah. neighbor who has a, who planted the sweet corn for me in the sweet corn uh, portion, uh, he has a row cleaners. And I think he did a real good job of moving that all aside uh, and then left a, a nice cleaner strip there. Too I bad we don't have the video for that. Well, what, what I will say on that point, and I'll get to your question, sir. You'll notice we, we depressed a little bit here, but we didn't collapse it. So that tells me that this system can work. It's just going to be, how do you fine tune like a ham radio back and forth between if we would have had all of the biomass we want, like you would have in the red clover, how do we get through it? Now, I think, you know, I honestly think it would probably be easier to do in a modern red clover versus an antiquated alfalfa that you were talking about or a cure clover that's very rhizomatous. So I think you could figure that out. And it might be something as simple as, adjusting the heck out of the down pressure. Like that's one thing I'm impressed with the soil warrior out there. Just, do you guys see the size of that airbag that's on that machine? I mean, that can really chop through quite a few roots, but I think you're onto something having a coulter go ahead and kind of chop before you had a shank. I also think after hearing Jody's presentation on soil compaction that the a straight shank versus a parabolic is gonna be critical in this. Yeah, this is just showing some of the stuff we put on just to try again, just emphasizing the biology. This was a corn blend. You know, Charles went through in with this. Um, uh, the jury is still out on whether yeah. these actually are effective. Um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in them, but uh, if you talk to DeGay Brown, he says, oh, it's a waste of money. I figure my response as we got into this uh, earlier and my response to uh, Andrew's comment about, is it really going to be beneficial? Is it? If you invest in all that equipment and all that computer technology and things, why not just go ahead and invest in the biologicals as well? So. Yeah, especially because typically they're cheaper too. This video, it's shorter, but I like to show it because you can see there's a diffuser and there's the seeds coming out. It's kind of hard to tell, but we had a diversity of mixtures um, that were going in there. And obviously I'm not on the road. That was just kind of getting a video of it, but you can see the seeds right here. One of the reasons to overseed is because uh, even though strip tillage is minimum disturbance, it's still disturbance. Uh, as a soil conservationist pointed out to me, strip tillage is still tillage. And when you go in there and you disturb that soil, you make an ideal seed bed for the small seeded weeds, like mare's tail, like uh, 
water pig hemp. weeds, water hemp, yep. all those small seed of seeds. And we did get a flush of those, which is one of the reasons why uh, it was not quite as One bad. other thing I'll point out, like this was 2019 and we all commiserated <laughs> on how bad that year was across the Corn Belt. Um, I also think that this would have been very different. I mean, that aggregation is good, you see there. This was June, first week of June. Typically, a good planting date in our area is going to be, you know, the 20th of April, third week of April for corn and beans. So this was a lot later. Everything was late that year. Don't get me wrong. I think the results would have been very different had we got in. Because I remember vividly, we finished. And uh, I joked that my brother-in-law who's not here. He's, uh, he's every bit as smart as me, but you'd never know it. He's just rough around the edges. And I joke his superpower is ingesting nicotine and Red Bull to stay awake for 50 hours. And we did that in 2019 and we planted 1800 acres in 40 hours. It was, it was a rat race. And then we came to do this. So we were tired. And I remember the reason we pushed so hard was A, it was late and B, we were afraid there was another inch or two of rain in the forecast. Well, I'll be danged. We got all that done and then the rain didn't happen. Now, luckily we didn't push it in mud, but you know, the guys that were getting eight hours of sleep weren't any further behind than us. So that was frustrating. But I tell you all that because this would not be typical of our planting conditions. Now, I told you we need, I think we need to wait to let that get tall if you were to flail chop it. So we would still be planting later. I think for us, if we were in this system and we are gonna, I'm gonna show on the very last slide what we're trying going forward. I would think, you know, maybe three weeks later, so second week of May, you know, just let it get tall, but then it's still going to be a little bit more mellow. You're still going to have more rain events in May than you do in June. In you can't, I'm sure you can't see it all. Can, can we back up? Yeah. You can't see them. Uh, there, uh, it was about 11 different species in here. Uh, well, you can see there, you know, there's one, there's one, one there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. I mean, we, you can see the diversity we had. Yeah. And again, for an overseeding, reseeding, I think that's the ticket. You know, if you get a perennial established, I think this is a mechanism that would help quite a bit. Some people have gone to uh, like spring tine. Um, that's a good picture. Of that. uh, tines to, to kind of rough up the soil yeah. after. Like a spring tine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this just kind of shows the planter going through. And again, I like it because it shows how busy it was. And we were not utilizing conceal on this. We could have. <laughs> I think that would have helped too, honestly. Uh, we were trying this to be organic and we didn't have enough product to, to do what we wanted to do there. But you know, you can see I've got really my level there. This. <laughs> but you can see it just flies right through. Yeah, we don't, there's no narration in this one anyway, Charles. So it's okay. okay. But as it's coming, you know, and again, 20, 30 years ago when I was a really young pup, we never would have thought about, oh, that planter, it's level in that field. Well, now that we have the technology with load cells and everything, we can tell that you're moving. So you can watch and that's where that hydraulic downforce comes in. I'm not going very fast. I'm, I think I planted this at five mile an hour. It's not like this wasn't a high speed setup, but I think you're gonna need, you know, some pretty aggressive downforce system with a PGC. I, I really do, but, Again, I'm a farmer too. I don't want to spend a crap ton of money. I think it's okay to have an Air Force system and just go a little slower. Look at how the strips were freshened as the planter went over it. Yeah, so you can see that's them the other thing. You can just see how beautiful those look. But this, except for the row not being uh, thick enough for the mulching effect, this was exactly what we wanted. I mean, we were, it was late. We didn't like planting in June, but everything was late. We didn't like, we didn't realize that that was as big of a problem, but the way that looked, this looked beautiful for the first half of the season. It really did. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just more about how the tilth was after we planted. Got, I'm gonna skip forward watching our time. But this is what it looked like. So we've already planted, and I, as I said, we had to go over it again because of the hydraulic issue so that we could do the inner seeding on top of it. But that's a nice view, just seeing what you've got. I mean, call me a romantic. I just think that's gorgeous. That's how I would love my fields to look every year if I could figure this out. Yeah, I think we'll get there. Yeah. 
you want the, to hear? Um, where, where are we on time? Okay. But I, I think we'll just skip that because okay. they've heard me let's, talk enough. Let's, do, let's get in. to the results. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is actually a photograph from the sweet corn uh, cura clover trial. And you can see the real importance of having uh, precision guidance. Uh, the uh, neighbor who planted this did not have any kind of precision guidance system. So you see that the corn is coming up off center. And then also you see how yellow it is. And you're going to have to continue to fertilize, use fertilizer, because this is actually two crops. This is a cover crop and a cash crop. Right. I think the other thing to bring up is the type of bar, the width of your berm. I mean, these are things that we all know here at a strip till conference, but you know, the wider your berm, the, the more margin of error you've got. So I think if you've got a rig that creates a wider bar, you can get by with the gentleman who had the 40 series tractors. And I mean, he had RTK, <clears throat> so he would have been okay. But my point is the width of that berm gives you a certain amount of margin. <laughs> Uh, Charles did a really cool study on this on his too. So, uh, as I said earlier, <laughs> the soil health is a real important criteria for me. So I did some soil measurements. I did a soil infiltration, um, both in my neighbor's conventional uh, plot that did not have any cover crops whatsoever. It was conventionally tilled. He plowed, he dissed, and everything. And then the 2019 curra planting that did not have very much uh, survival, and then the better planting in 2020. And you can see, even though this is not scientific, it's not replicated, the results are consistent. They're always higher in the conventional. Yeah, and I'm skipping ahead just to show you, this is the slide of the infiltration system that Charles did. That's another reason that it's very exciting to consider this system. So I go back to what I said in my area, you know, I don't have any subsurface moisture and I've got a record crop possibly because we've gotten big rain events and I don't have covers on everything, but you know, we've been fewer rain events, higher intensity. That's going to become more important. This type of information on water infiltration rates become more important as we get that type of lower frequency, higher events. Especially on highly erodible yeah. land. If we can get that kind of infiltration without having runoff, I think we'll be really um, years ahead. So Charles yeah. had these, uh, was this a Haney test or I forget no, exactly this what this was. A, uh, the Ward Laboratories does a microbial analysis. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the Haney test. We did do a Haney test, but more importantly uh, for me, it was a microbial analysis. And... Uh, I highlighted the ones that are most important to me, the PLFA, uh, phospholipid fatty acid, mm -hmm. uh, and the fungal to, bio, fungal to bacteria ratio. Uh, the positive to negative means that the... the um, uh, it's more of a one-to-one. -one the the bacteria, the, the good bacteria, the anaerobic... Uh, the, I'm sorry. The aerobic bacteria. Yeah. No, uh, it's... Uh, yeah. Gram positive that's it, and gram negative. It, thank it. you. Yep. Thank you. And then you should uh, be up here. You know, me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Charles was good to highlight these red ones. And again, not replicated, not scientific, but diversity, more is better, right? So yeah. the concepts ring true. And we have anecdotal, I'll call it anecdotal because it's yeah. not replicated, but clearly moving in the right direction. Uh, even though this is a snapshot, Ward Laboratories has what they call a soil health index, which is a combination of the biology, the chemistry, and the uh, physical properties of the soil. And you can see that in the conventional, it is less than, uh, than oh, the sorry, curricular. I didn't mean to hit that. You can see how significantly higher it is. Yeah. Right there, I mean, you can see we've got some weeds coming through. I attribute that to mulching too soon, okay? That corn looks pretty good. June planted, I mean, I had <laughs> relatively high hopes because this, this was like an organic trial. I was not shooting for 250, you know, like I would in a normal year. 
our APHs are 220 and 65. Mm. So we'll, we always shoot for 250 and a lot of times we can get it. I would have been happy with 185 or 90 on this. I think we were on our way until later on. That's what I wanted to share on this slide. Now I want to unpause and we'll just click through because we're getting close on time. Okay, bottom line, let's talk about what worked, what didn't. We've kind of already hit on it. The strip building, I'm going to say that the perennial ground cover makes an absolutely beautiful tilt. Notwithstanding the consideration that some of you guys have been great to contribute, you know, questions like how you get through the root mass and the root balls, I think it's worth the effort to figure it out. This is an absolutely beautiful berm. You need RTK guidance. I think that's almost a, just a given when you're doing strip till, but I think it's just emphasized that, and I appreciate what the gentleman who farmed with the 40 series tractors was doing. He said, I don't need new stuff. I just need the new technology. I really appreciate that. Put RTK on an older piece of equipment and run with it. I think it's quite obvious on the soil health. And I'm standing in front of you, Charles. I apologize. Oh, okay. the, uh, the results he had, again, they were anecdotal. They were not replicated. Clearly, the soil was healthier. Clearly, it was better. Well, the yields were disappointing. We're not going to hide that, clearly. But we've talked about why, and it was really weed suppression. You need to let those covers get tall before you flail chop. You need to be patient if you're going to do it this way. Now, there is research, and I wanted to bring this up. There is research being done. I forget where. I haven't saved it, but I have seen it where they are some that are, instead of doing like a flail chop, they're letting it get tall and using something like a citric acid or even a glyphosate if it's really well established to kill it back and, and you know, I, uh, you've all heard of kudzu, the scourge of the south, you know, I've, I've heard glyphosate doesn't do anything on that. It kills the leaves and then it comes back. That's the concept. And that would be another way to do this, right? I think the flail chopping makes sense for those of you that raised your hand as livestock guys, because then you've got a machine that has more asset utilization because you can use it in multiple ways. Yeah. This next slide really might be more of a discussion, kind of like we've all been having up to this point. What are some of the considerations, you know? I, I'm open-minded that I maybe need to change on my farm doing more spring strips instead of fall. Fall, I just feel like I'm hedging my bets. I'm getting it done. I feel good about it. But for this system, I think I would do fall, but then I, I would like to come back, just kind of like some of the conversations we had. But if you're a livestock guy, when are you more or less busy, right? And I feel like, you know, that's a consideration that needs to be taken care of. You know, the horsepower, I mean, that's something that's always a consideration. I think it can be done on a smaller scale. I mean, uh, I was talking to the Orthman salesman. And I said, well, fortunately, I'd already bought, you know, my land lover last year at auction. And he said, well, you can, you can get by with an eight row and that would help you. I'm like, yeah, if I had another person to run it. But but again, you know, horsepower and these other considerations can, can factor into it as well. You know, the initial cost, that was one reason for the flail chopping. And again, if you're a livestock guy, it's something you probably have, asset utilization, right? Um, and then lastly, we already talked about the guidance. So again, I've already hit all this, but for us, West Central, Northwest Central Illinois, to make this work, I would probably start with a perennial that also had something that I knew was going to get going probably a reseeding like a balanza clover mm -hmm. mixed with red clover, you know, maybe oat, I don't know, something that's just going to create good biomass. Get that in the fall, do my strip till. Then I would come back and I would strip freshen after I mowed or sprayed. I'll probably spray now that I'm not researching organics and then plant immediately afterward. I think that it can be done. Yeah. And to that point, this is my farm this year. And it's, these aren't, these over here are not perennials. You know, we honestly, we've tried cover crops for a couple of years. This was the first year we tried it on a big scale. Why? Because when we had bought that Valmar for the SARE unit, we completed the grant. Then we had a windstorm. Well, that sucked. What are we going to do? Because we are no-till strip till. We don't have anything. We found a John Deere 2623. We bought it relatively cheap for 20 grand, put another five or six ground in our own sweat equity and fixing the blades. And now we had, I mean, it's a disc, but it's more, less of a disc and more of a VT bar. W my brother-in-law can weld the crack of dawn. We fabricated a, a bracket and put the Valmar on top of it. 
Last year, we tested it on all of our acres. Half of the bean acres got cover crop. <clears throat> this was what it was like planting into it. That cover crop before the planter went over, it was this tall. I did some cuttings and I estimated that it's around 7,000 to 8,000 pounds of biomass. I came back. Now, I planted too deep. I went two inches thinking that eh, I want to make sure because the soil temp wasn't quite where I wanted it to be. I, did, I didn't want it to fluctuate. My stand was uneven, didn't look good. Now you wouldn't know it. I mean, it, they look really, really good. So I tell you, the lessons we learned on this are applying to an annual cover crop and the benefit of the grant still applied because we're doing something different. Here's what I want to emphasize for today. There's my family farm where I grew up. And if you turn around facing this way, you would see Pilot Knob. That's the name of our popcorn. That's the big hill that overlooks our family farm. It's a major watershed divide. Water on the north side goes to the Illinois River. Water on the south side goes to the Mississippi. So it's right in the middle of where that 960 acres is at. It's only one acre. Looks kind of rough here. This is a mixture of native Illinois perennials. And I had the list, can't find it. I forgot where it's at. I, I've got it hidden on my computer. I was gonna put it up on a slide, but it's uh, one of them was cone bundle flower. Bundle and, flower, yes. And there are a few others, but there's legumes, grasses, all sorts of things. It's part of a grant with the Land Institute. And they had a couple of farmers, one of them's in Eastern Illinois, I think it's Will Glasick over there, yeah. organic farmer. And about five or, yeah, yeah, five or, or, or six really. of us. And they <laughs> wanted to have native perennials doing this. So we're gonna try it again. The difference is the grant allowed me, basically I'm gonna take a year off. Now I know that's not feasible, you know, in the real world, but right now let's see if we can make it work. And then we can mm -hmm. come back and I'm tickled with what you were saying with the red clover because that's something that can be done with Let's just plant a two, three bean, early bean, and get in early as heck and get that clover established. So, but if we can get the concept to work here, and I've already mowed, this was right before I mowed it, uh, or my brother-in-law mowed it. We had a bunch of ragweed on one side. And the way I seeded this, I used that same VT bar with the Valmar seeder. So it wasn't drilled, it wasn't perfect. You know, that bar is probably set a shade deep. It's an inch and three quarter. We don't go that deep, but you know, like uh, Jody had said in the other room, you, you should really only be going an inch. Um, but the stand I got here, yeah. part of me is like, I don't really want to change that. That was beautiful. But this is what we're trying. And since it's close to my farm, I'm going to get the strip till bar out this fall after I mow and after there's good biomass, I'm going to put strips in and then I'll do it again in the spring and we're going to plant corn in it and see where we end up. So well, oh, one of the uh, exciting things for me about getting this uh, information out is because after I put out a press release uh, in 2020, I got an email from um, a researcher at the Land Institute in Salina County. He says, yeah. uh, I've been working with Curaclover and I'm real interested in your projects. So that's how this collaboration developed with, with Andrew. I told him he wanted to do it with me. And I said, I don't have the equipment, but I turned it over to Andrew. And he has the intellect. I have the machine. So yeah. there's, there's, there's that. It's a team effort when you try and learn new things. Yeah. So this is some of the future work uh, that for us moving forward, you know, Iowa State and then Charles talked about uh, here at the Land Institute. Um, Can we back up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, Brandon, in turn, introduced me to uh, Raj, who had gotten a grant, a sizable grant, a multi-million dollar grant for a kind of a long-term study of perennial ground covers. And he has gotten other researchers from Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri all to work on this. And so it's kind of having a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Here's the last slide. That right there doesn't look too bad. The corn does not look good. Yeah. And that's because we, it was later planted and the, the corn was not competing. Like if we would have had a better mulch effect, I bet this still would have looked about like this. I bet the corn would have been a lot more. I also think if, uh, if we would have had fertilizer on the planter, I think that would have, I mean, there's other little things, but mm. you can see how quickly it changed from really good to not real, not very good at all. But we one were, we, we were onto something. I mean, I showed you that one picture. Yeah. So 
one of the things I learned from Brandon was that he said that the green will reflect from the cover crop up into the crop and it will change the physiology of the plant and will stunt it. Uh, not just stunt it, but will set back the formation of the, of the ears later on. And uh, so hence, if you stun it with a mulch and then it grows back later, once it's further up, less of that damage yeah. is. So what used. Brandon does is he just goes over and kills, uh, he doesn't kill it, but he sprays it with Roundup to turn it brown. You can use Roundup, you can use Liberty, uh, maybe yeah. even, I don't Anything know. Anything else. Yeah. When, whenever I try something different, I try and figure out, I also sell crop insurance, so I'm, I'm a risk manager by trade. And one of the things I try and do is say, how do we make this at worst revenue neutral? You know, um, and I'll give you an example and then tie it to this. So when I first started strip till, I said, okay, this is gonna cost more, obviously, because I've got a bar. My bar wasn't as expensive, but I said, this is gonna cost more than what we have been doing. So I need to cut my fertilizer rate at least enough to cover that extra cost. So that was one of the things I did. And since then, I'm only putting on 25, 30% of university rates. I soil test every four years and then I don't, I haven't had to VRT anything since. So I tell you that because to your point, and when we're doing this, what are our expectations for this system? How do you define success? And that's gonna be different for each of us, whether you've got livestock or a grain only. For me, success would be, you know, if I'm making more money at 200 or 210 bushel corn than the guy at 280 with fewer inputs, you know, that's success. So the expectations, you know, how are you gonna define success? For me, if I'm creating more biology and I can reduce my inputs and, you know, not need to go out there with an herbicide or I go out with glyphosate only and I don't need a residual. We use Zidua Pro on our beans. I mean, that's a good chemistry. It's expensive though, obviously. We use Corvus and Laudus on our corn because it's safe for my popcorn. It's expensive. Well, if you had a system like this, yeah, my yields are lower, but if I'm saving, depending on where you buy your chemical, between 15 and $30 an acre, you know, and then you start adding up the soil biology and the resiliency long-term, maybe 200 is better than 250. Yeah. But again, how do you define success?